we're thinking of a certain pre set of sort of preset topics, which are good. Those are all great topics. They're all biblical. Mm -hmm. And yet, if that's the only kind of theology we think about, there's like these major themes that are actually hugely important to the theology of the Bible that we then will kind of ignore, right? Because they're more story themes. And we tend to, we're looking at more like abstract theological themes, right? Mm -hmm. But in the, in the world of the Bible, those things can't be separated because most of the Bible's theology comes through its stories. Well, Paul Lamachella, thank you so much for coming on the Anabaptist Perspectives podcast. Uh, you've been on this podcast before, but it's been a minute. So, yeah, and yeah. it hasn't been in person. So, this is this is a nice, this is nice. This yeah. is great. Yeah. Because yeah. uh, you're up here at, at Faith Builders teaching a course and happen to be in the area. So, I figured we'd sit down and do this. Yeah. Um, you want to take just a minute, introduce yourself briefly, and we'll just jump right in. Yeah. So, um, I have been teaching uh, biblical studies for. Uh, several years now. I have a PhD in biblical theology, which we'll talk about what that means in a mm -hmm. minute. Um, and and so I've been, my passion is to teach uh, and can convey the beauty of how the whole Bible fits together and how this really reshapes our, our way of reading scripture and understanding the Christian life. So I live in Pennsylvania with my wife, Laura, and my three and a half month old baby, Giovanni. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's kind of who I am. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. So, um, you teach a lot on, yeah, like you said, the biblical storyline and this concept of biblical theology mm -hmm. uh, versus systematic, or I don't know if you want to call them versus systematic, but however you want to define it. Can we just start with some definitions? What is that? And why do you believe biblical theology is is important for us today? Yeah. So, and I always, the uh, the term is sort of deceptive because mm. um, to, in an everyday average usage, when we say biblical theology, we mean theology that's based on the Bible, as opposed mm. to like unbiblical theology, like good <laughs> theology versus bad theology, which is why I, I never title my classes Introduction to Biblical Theology. I call it something like um, Understanding the Bible Storyline, because nobody knows, like that's, we don't use the term biblical theology that way. But in mm. in um, in more academic circles, the the term biblical theology means something, uh, has have kind of a technical distinct meaning. Mm -hmm. And um, so... For today, uh, we'll, I'll unpack that just a tiny bit. So when we usually think of theology, we're usually thinking of what we call systematic theology, which is basically uh, answers to the questions um, traditionally, kind of what is the doctrine of God, the doctrine of man, the doctrine of sin, the doctrine of the church. And what usually we want when we ask those questions is we're looking for sort of the conclusion, just the summary. Like if I took everything in the Bible about this and sort of synthesized it, mm. Um, maybe put it in a blender or something, what would the end, what would the kind of end statement be, right? How would I summarize yeah. this? And how, in a way that sort of somewhat connects with my own, my mm -hmm. own cultural space. So it's kind of uh, going through, uh, th I'm sure this is over oversimplifying, but correct me if I'm wrong, going through the Bible and basically pulling out the passages that fit with that particular thing you're trying to, the Trinity, and you find all the relevant passages and kind of build a theology on that? It, it, or kind is that of, oversimplified? Yeah. Well, uh, how you get there is, is a, is, kind of the next step of the question, but, mm. but yes, it involves take, it basically involves drawing the conclusions. That's, that's what matters in systematics. Mm. At the end of the day, what are the Bible's conclusions about the Trinity or about the doctrine of salvation or, or things like that? Mm. Okay. So that's kind of what we're looking for. We're looking for sort of these propositions that kind of, um, that are the conclusions. And then we take that and, and figure out mm -hmm. at that distillation, figure out, you know, what do we do with that? So that's that's what we would call systematic theology. Yeah. And um, that's what most of us mean when we call theology. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I was going to say, like, okay, cause we were talking about this before you know, doing this interview a uh, couple couple nights ago. And, and it's just thinking, like, that's about the only thing I'm familiar with. Mm -hmm. You know, when it comes right. to theology, that, oh, of course, that's just right. how you do it. You know, right, I got exactly. the, the books on my shelf, the right. systematic theology by yeah. whoever, you know, and yeah. all that all that stuff. Um, so this is where I get very interested because I'm always curious about things like this. Um, where does biblical, yes. the, or what we're calling biblical theology, yes. and again, probably to clarify with that, doesn't mean all the other theologies are unbiblical. No, 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 no. Um, this is a separate, distinct yeah. technical meaning. So maybe give us maybe a, a brief definition, but yeah. also an example, yes. like what is this? So... Biblical theology, in contrast, is is saying what do what are the the themes that the biblical hmm. authors care about, and how do they develop? So, in systematics, we care mostly about conclusions, right? At the end of the day, what does the Bible say, and how do I how can I frame it in in ways that are understandable to me and my 
culture, mm -hmm. right? So often involving a little bit more philosophical language, things mm -hmm. like that. It's a bit more removed from the text, but it draws the conclusions. Mm -hmm. Biblical theology, we say basically, how does this theme develop in the whole story? It's, it's about, yes, conclusions, but more about how you get there too. So if I, so a good example of the difference between biblical theology and systematics is um, in systematic theology, if I say, um, what is the th sort of, what does the Bible teach about um, the, about salvation? All right. I'm going to say, mm -hmm. well, you know, there's stuff about justification, sanctification, blah, 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 blah. And I'll explain some of that. But if I'm asking that from a biblical theology perspective, what I'm going to do is tell the story of how redemptive history unfolds, how mm. the, how God's sort of redemptive plan of salvation unfolds through history. And the, the story lot, the story of the progressive unfolding of that theme mm -hmm. is just as important as whatever conclusions at the end, mm -hmm. because it's, it's in, it, we, we understand the theology of the text mm -hmm. as we see how the story develops in, in redemptive mm -hmm. history. So that's kind of what biblical theology means in a meta sense, in a, in a bit, whole Bible biblical theology. You can also use it in smaller senses, like what is a theology of Paul? Mm -hmm. And in that I'm saying not like, what are all the conclusions I can draw in a systematic sense, as much as saying, what are the themes that Paul cares about? And how does he yeah. unpack those, right? So it's in, in that way, it's almost doing a little mini systematic theology just of Paul, right? And not bringing to the table, here's my list of seven doctrines that I wanna find in, that I wanna see what Paul says. It's saying, what, what if Paul were to, how I said it to my class the other day, if Paul were to come to Faith Builders, um, because I'm here at Faith Builders right now, um, what would, and, and we said, hey, just teach on the things that you think are the most important. What would his list be, right? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so you'd end up having some themes that we don't have in when we sort of do systematics, because he'll probably, one of his themes might be the theme of suffering, right? Hmm. Or, um, or of the, of the resurrection mm -hmm. or things like that. And so that's, that's another way of, that's a smaller picture way of saying what mm -hmm. biblical theology. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a, it's doing theology in a way that's, that focuses on the authors of the texts and the world of the text and the progressive unfolding of redemptive history. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's some of the distinction. So to make sure I'm understanding this correctly, it sounds a lot of what you're saying is fairly story driven actually, yes. like the, this thread throughout mm -hmm. the Bible. Um, and again, b beforehand, you, you were talking about some of those options of ways you can mm -hmm. trace this thread. And you had mentioned this theme of exile. Yeah. And I, I and we didn't really get into it before filming, so this is all new for me. Mm -hmm. And I, I'd love to hear you use that as a bit of an example. How do we follow that that thread, yeah. that storyline mm -hmm. through through the Bible? And this is a good example of ways in which, when we think of theology, we're thinking mm -hmm. of a certain pre set of sort of preset topics, which are good. Those are all great topics. They're all biblical. And yet, if that's the only kind of theology we think about, there's like these major themes that are actually hugely important to the theology of the Bible, mm -hmm. i.e. biblical theology, um, that we then will kind of ignore, right? Because they're more story themes. And we tend to, we're looking at more like abstract theological themes, right? Mm -hmm. But in the, in the world of the Bible, those things can't be separated because most of the Bible's theology comes through its stories, right? Mm -hmm. Especially that most of the Bible is story, right? The majority of it is. So exile is a great example of that. Um, it's a theme that we don't think much about, but I think that the New Testament, well, the whole Bible is a huge theme, the whole Bible. And it's something that the New Testament authors um, believe is a very important theme for what it means to live as a Christian now in our age. So it's not just a very, you know, a very fascinating and engaging, you know, theme, but it's something that is meant to to shape the way, shape the way we live. So, um, so the theme of exile really starts, and and this, all of these themes are so inter, interwoven because stories are good stories are mm -hmm. are very, you know, symbol laden and very interconnected. Um, and the story, the the great story of scripture, um, we're dealing with something that isn't merely a collection of stories written by human authors, but is, mm -hmm. is one story driven in narrative and in history by, mm -hmm. by the divine author. So very interwoven. So, but the theme of exile really begins with the garden of Eden, right? Because, and this, this story of the garden sets the stage for so many of the themes. Um, but Adam and Eve's judgment, so Adam and Eve are home, right? In the garden. This is the land, this is the blessed land. Um, this is the place where God's presence is, and this is the place where they can have eternal life, 
Um, and then in their rebellion uh, against God, the the judgment really is a judgment of exile, right? Getting mm-hmm. kicked mm-hmm. out of the garden, which means kick, getting kicked out of God's presence and getting sent into the realm of death, right? It's those it's the loss of those three things, basically. Um, loss of God's presence, loss of the blessed land, and the loss of um, the loss of life. So this the, the the Bible story just sets up with the idea of humanity through our rebellion against God getting getting exiled from our true home, the place of blessing, the place of God's presence, and exiled into mm-hmm. into um, a land of death and, and evil. And then, um, sort of the rest of the Bible story is a is a is a story of getting back into Eden. Right. That's that's kind of what the whole story is. And so you see these like little ways um, that God is God is working to undo the the exile of of the of Genesis three, uh, which drives the story all the way to the end. But we have so Abraham, right, is the next kind of place in this where God promises him a land and he promises him descendants and he promises him blessing. These are kind of the three promises of Genesis one and two. And Yet, for most of his life, he's wandering around as an exile. Yeah. Waiting for that day, mm-hmm. right? And then his people, his descendants end up getting sent to, getting, you know, end up in Egypt in exile, essentially. So for so many years, God's people have the promise of getting back to a, not fully Eden, but a mm-hmm. blessed land under God's, with God's presence. Mm-hmm. And yet they're living in bondage and oppression and slavery and in wandering around in a land that isn't, that isn't home. Right, mm-hmm. so it's exile, not because of their sin, but it's it's still they're waiting for God's redemption, right? Um, and then the flip, so the flip side of the exile motif is the Exodus, because the Exodus story is the restoration from exile. So yeah. exile and Exodus are are sort of intricately connected to each other in the story of the Bible, and so what happens in the uh, in the Exodus story is that God's people are are brought out through through redemption, through mighty acts of salvation, out of exile, and t- toward this um, this place of belonging and home. So those are sort of the precursors. But then, really, when we think of exile, we're thinking of um, Israel's exile in Babylon. Yeah, and so then I'll, yeah, so this that's next so bit. this this just kind <clears> of <throat> you you basically took us through the majority of the the Old Testament, right? Not yet. I mean, yeah. But you know what I mean? Like you're starting in, you know, with Eden all the way through, Mm -hmm. you know, say the Babylonian Mm -hmm. exile. Um, That is a very interesting way. Whereas I think um, for myself and and other people and whatever that, that I've talked to, you know, we would tend to, to more slices, like what does read this book, and that's right. kind of like what it's saying, right. but not tra- tracking that 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 theme the whole way through. Right. And I was actually talking to one of your students here recently, and he was just saying how powerful this concept has been for himself, seeing that story going all the way through the Bible, and how mm-hmm. um, affirming that is of yeah. how intricate and beautiful and interwoven oh, yeah. all of Scripture is. Absolutely, you know the whole yeah. thing, and it's like this couldn't have just happened. This is right. this is really powerful. Yeah, and beautiful. no, because Scripture is not only true and good, but it's also beautiful, mm. and this is part of how mm. that how that manifests and 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 it's so important one of the reasons you can't be just looked at in isolation like books at a time or whatever is that each of these stories are built on the previous ones right so you're mm. in in Abraham you're supposed to see echoes of the Genesis story mm. right you can't understand why in the world God is calling this one family and pro- giving him these promises mm. if you don't understand Genesis you know 1 to 3 because this is the mm-hmm. first steps of the reversal of uh, of exile, mm-hmm. and then and likewise we'll keep seeing that as we go on. But um, so th- I mean this this takes us to sort of um, the covenant with Moses and Israel, mm-hmm. and what is central to that covenant is okay. You've been released from Exodus uh, from some from Egypt from slavery to Egypt. Now here are the conditions of the covenant, and if you are faithful and loyal to Yahweh, your Redeemer, and your husband. So this is where this all gets tied to yeah. the marriage and unfaithfulness theme, which is another big theme um, in in the story, which we can't talk about today. But um, if you're faithful, then you will have you will be blessed in the land. You will be the one land that has God's presence in your midst, right? Um, the land itself will be blessed. Your descendants will be blessed. This is this is as close to Eden as you can get, right? Mm-hmm. God's land, God's blessing, God's presence. 
But then the flip side is that if you are unfaithful, if you if you walk in rebellion, um, essentially what's going to happen, the, the curses of the covenant, as iterated in, say, Deuteronomy, is is basically you're going to get de-exodist. Um, <laughs> oh, wow. Okay, I yeah. have not thought of that so, before. Well, it's That's really, fascinating. It's very, it's very fascinating. So it, it's, it's explicit um, in Deuteronomy. It's very interesting how it's very interesting how the um, some of the curses are spoken of um, at the very end in Deuteronomy twenty eight. So this this whole iteration of the blessings and curses mm-hmm. of the covenant, and then Yahweh says, "If you do not um, keep the covenant, if you are unfaithful, blah blah blah, then Yahweh will scatter you among all the peoples from one end of the earth to the other, and there you shall serve other gods." And among these nations, you will find no respite and there will be no resting place for the, uh, for the sole of your foot. But um, your life will hang in doubt before you. In the morning, you'll say, I wish it were evening. In the evening, you'll say, I wish it were morning. You'll just be kind of freaked out, terrified all the time. And then it ends with, Yahweh will bring you back in ships to Egypt, a journey that I promised that you should never make again. And there you shall offer yourselves for sale to your enemies as male and female slaves, but there will be no buyer." Whoa. And this isn't meant to be a literal, you will literally go back to Exodus, but it's taking the the sort of slavery back to Egypt, but it's taking the slavery in Egypt story, yeah, which was their redemption story and saying that hmm. you're going to be de-Exodus, but even with the plot twist, because you'll go back to slavery in Egypt, so to speak, but nobody's even going to buy you as <laughs> slaves, right? You'll be so worthless that you'll be really wow. stranded. I've never noticed that when I've read that passage. That yeah, it is fascinating. It is very fascinating. Yeah. So then, of course, this is what winds up playing out in Israel's history. They're unfaithful. And then their story just crashes and burns, right? In exile. Yeah. They the, they lose the kingship and um, they're they're carted off. And they, they're exiled again into out of the sort of Eden, the closest thing to Eden you can get, mm-hmm. um, and sent into a world of God's judgment, a world of oppression by other, other, um, other nations and away from, away from home. Mm. And so that, that is looming so large in, especially the time of around the first century of Jesus, because God had brought them back from exile, kind of ish. So there's this sense that they were sort of released from exile, um, in the, in the Persian period. And yet there was also the sense that exile was still continuing because part of the promises of return from exile in the prophets, and we're skipping over so much, Mm -hmm. but the prophets see a day, which is all based off of Deuteronomy 30, um, because Moses says, you guys will go into exile because you're very stubborn. And I just know. And, but then, (laughs) but then God and the other side of exile, God will bring you back and eventually circumcise your hearts and bless you again. So the prophets say, look, God will visit his people and bring them back. But when he does so, that means also he's going to send the Messiah. He's going to um, to be their true king, to restore them, restore the land, bring about new creation, forgiveness of sins, all that stuff. And that stuff hadn't happened. So yeah, there was a new temple that was, the second temple that was built. It was like kind of, kind of mm-hmm. so-so. And they were still under the thumb of various rulers uh, through this whole period. By the first century, it was the Romans. They weren't really returned from exile. Yeah. D- does does um, the destruction of the temple again by the Romans and, and the exile again come into this story at all? Or is that yeah. just... Well, it kind of it kind of does. Um, so what I should say is that what, what, is, what Israel was looking for mm-hmm. because of its exile, right? In its exile, what the prophets said would happen is guess what? The flip side, a new exodus. Yeah. Okay. Right? So, yeah. okay, this is all built on the story so far, right? Um, their slavery in Egypt, God led them out in Exodus. And so the exile to Babylon or whatever, the prophets say there's going to be a new Exodus. And they use this incredible imagery from the first Exodus. Mm-hmm. They speak of God, um, they speak of God bringing back the people. There's one or two passages in Isaiah. Well, yeah, yeah I've never thought of that before. It was as, all over. As what Isaiah is saying is is essentially he's describing, a, yeah, like you're 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 basically calling it a new exodus or like another. Wow. Okay. The, yeah. The, yeah. Mm-hmm. So okay, I'll give is, you one example. I, I see what you're saying. I've just I hadn't thought of it in those terms before. Yeah. But this um, is the, and the thing is, part of the reason this is important is that the New Testament authors. Mm-hmm. Paul, Jesus, as an author, but the New Testament characters, Peter, we'll get to later. 
But basically, I mean, Paul says when he's with before Agrippa, I think, he's like, look, all I, all I do, all I'm preaching is what Moses and the prophets said would happen, that the Messiah would suffer and that rising from the dead, he would be the first yeah. to, he would, you know, bring light both to our people and Gentiles or whatever. Mm. He, Paul thinks that his whole message is just saying, oh, the vision of the prophets has come to fulfillment, right? And so mm. he's absolutely steeped in these stories and we miss a lot of Paul even, or the New Testament when we, when we miss this. So Okay, so, and that comes back to this whole concept of biblical theology, uh, the, the storyline through scripture to where you're saying it, Paul makes so much more sense when you, also are tracing the thread through the Old Testament Because that's all he's and, doing. Yeah. That's all, and the Gospels. The Gospels yeah. are full of this. We'll get, and you, and, but huh. often the New Testament texts, they're like good stories, not dumb ones, where the like bad stories, the difference between good and bad stories, partly, <laughs> bad stories have no plot. But also, um, bad stories often, they, they're too, they're too preachy, right? They yeah. explain everything to you, right? They're like, you know, this means that. And you're like, I don't care. Like, well, it's just annoying, right? I don't, don't tell me that. Just tell me, just show me it. And don't, don't be like pedantic about it. Ooh, that's a really good point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, the, get, I get you. And yeah, the Bible is often is, is told as, usually as a good story. Um, mm -hmm. it, is, it is always a good story, but they, it assumes, it often doesn't, doesn't explicitly say, hi, uh, this is a reference back to this. It just assumes <laughs> that you know. Yeah. Right. That's a, such a good point. Whereas it, back to like systematic theology, say, or, you know, and you're going through your list of doctrines of this or reading only this book. I, I, I can see the difference. This mm -hmm. is starting to make a lot of sense. So look at, um, here's one example from Isaiah 52. Mm -hmm. So how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of him who brings the good news. Okay. And this is very, we, we know this passage very well. Right. Mm -hmm. And this, this one passage and two or so others um, really is the background for the what the word gospel means in the gospel in the New Testament. Hmm. This is the origin of that. So that phrase "good news" is hmm. is where Jesus gets when he says when the authors of the gospel say Jesus went around proclaiming the good news. It's a it's a link back to Isaiah. So this is this is here. So how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of him who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good news of happiness, proclaim salvation, who says to Zion, "Your God reigns." Now, what that does not mean is, hey, God is king of the world. Mm. No. Um, we know this because the next verse, the voice of your watchmen, they lift up their voice. So these are, this is figuratively looking, kind of portraying city watchmen of, of Israel or Jerusalem, looking out and the watchmen are like, they lift up their voice and they sing for joy. Why? Because they see the return of Yahweh to Zion. So when it says your God reigns, what it means is God is coming back um, after exile He's abandoned yeah. us because we've abandoned him, but he's he's coming back. And that's the good news, that God is coming back mm -hmm. to do what? Well, that's what it says next. Break forth into singing, you waste places of Jerusalem, because Yahweh has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. He has bared his holy arm before the eyes of the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. He's bared his holy arm. This is, you can maybe catch a hint of Exodus here, right? The The... God's mighty arm of salvation, but it gets explicit in the next verse. Depart, go out from there, touch no unclean thing. Go out from the midst of her, purify yourselves, you who bear the vessels of Yahweh. For you shall not go out in haste and you shall not go out in flight. Where does that language come from? Well, it's a direct reference to the Exodus where the people were told oh. at, the, pass at, at the, the Passover night, right? Mm. Eat this quickly, have your cell phone fully charged, your keys in your pocket, because you're going to have to go out in haste, right? <laughs> right. And, but this Exodus, this is going to be the new greater Exodus, which will maybe take more time, but it'll also be more complete, right? Mm. For Yahweh will go before you and the God of Israel will be your rear guard. Like, what is that? Wow. It's, it's, the, it's the pillar of fire yeah. and the pillar of cloud. Yeah. Going before and behind the people. So in this, with this imagery, Isaiah is, is, is speaking of God's act of great act of salvation that he's about to do when he returns to his people as a new Exodus. Um, there's other passages where Yahweh, where, sorry, Isaiah talks about God's return as a, um, bringing back the exiles who are scattered over a, a whole ton of nations this time. He, he talks about drying up the channels of the rivers, the seven rivers or whatever, and bringing the people back in sandals, right? Over on dry ground. Oh. Right? Which is, which is sort of crossing the Red Sea imagery, 
and yet expanded because now the the people are exiled to many nations. And God's this is this imagery saying, "Look, I'm about to bring the people back from wherever they are," using New Exodus lang Exodus language again. So, return from exile is spoken of as New Exodus. I yeah, this a lot of this is new stuff. Like I, these are passages that I've obviously you know I've read that or I've read right, that right. before, but but like actually again basically what you're just to reiterate you're mm -hmm. you're tracing that thread through yeah you know through through the bible not through just like we're going to look at just one little passage right, right, right. or we're not um it seems like this this methodology mm -hmm. biblical theology isn't as much fixated on terms and definitions and you know am i am i reading that right it feels like systematic theology is all about what is this term and then we're going to study that right it, this it's, is very story driven from very, what you're very, showing. Yeah. yeah. And it's very it's very oriented around motifs, images, mm. and stories. Yeah. Because that's what the biblical authors are doing. Mm -hmm. Right? The biblical authors spend way less time on technical terms, which technical terms are great. Look, I've got a, you know, I've I have a PhD, so I, I'm, I'm all into technical terms in, <laughs> right. their, in their place. But um the biblical authors are way less into technical terms and way more into to, in, in a sense, their their version of technical terms are are these little images from that link back to previous stories. Ooh, that's fascinating. Yeah, yeah, that which that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So when when you actually say, it, I'm over here being like, oh yeah, yeah, that makes sense. But like, I I have to think that like it doesn't. Right. I don't naturally can right. think of the Bible that way. I think it's because maybe we're just so used to seeing. It, like here's a list of definitions, and right. here's the verses right. where they're right. brought out. You know, are yeah, I don't a lot know. of it's our oh. Western. You know, so most of hmm. most of the world is more story based, mm -hmm. story driven, right? And the and the Bible was written in the in those cultures, not in not in modern Western culture. So that's a great point. You know, that's the Bible is actually point. built to connect with most of the world more than it is with <laughs> us, right? So yeah. Anyway, I should get to a couple of things in the New Testament because so mm -hmm. so it sets up for. I love how Matthew's gospel opens, right? Because Matthew's gospel opens by taking that whole story. And saying, guess what? The fulfillment of this exile is about to be um, to be ended, and new Exodus is beginning. So mm. Matthew starts with the genealogy of Jesus, which most people think is super boring, but it's actually very interesting. <laughs> surprise, because Matthew Matthew um, deliberately breaks it up into three groups of fourteen generations, mm. somewhat artificial. Um, he's leaving some things out and stuff like that to get, because he wants the number 14 in all three. Mm. And what's, I won't go into all that, but what's fascinating is these three sections are explicitly built around um, the David, the Davidic um, kingship. So it starts with Abraham, the one who got the promises. And then the first section ends with the rise of David, the king. And then, um, and well, actually, I mean, he makes this explicit in verse 17. The generations from Abraham to David, 14. So that's the first section. And then David to the exile, the deportation to Babylon, 14. So the David to the loss of the Davidic kingship and the, okay, the people going into exile. And then the next three is the deportation to Babylon, the exile to the Messiah, 14. So just by structuring it that way, hmm. you're meant to say, ah, here comes the new David to bring hmm. back the people from exile. And then Jesus' birth narrative is basically a recapitulation of, uh, well, the first four chapters are a recapitulation of the exile and exodus story. So Jesus is born um, and Herod functions in this in the way the story is told as a Pharaoh figure, mm. right? Who um, decrees the, the the killing of the baby boys. Whoa, okay, I, okay, yeah. I don't know if I've ever thought yeah. of that. Oh, it's, uh, it's huge. That's, that's, that makes so much sense And though. then Jesus gets sent to Egypt, right? right? And then he comes back from Egypt yeah. Now we're starting. Now he's like functioning as Israel, right? He comes back from Egypt, um, and then the next thing in the story, basically, is he ends up in the Jordan River, right? Yeah. Wow. Right. Yeah. Re mm -hmm. re fulfilling the story of Israel, and then after that, he's in the wilderness for forty days, being tempted, which is his recapitulation of Israel's being tempted in the desert for forty years, mm -hmm. right? But he succeeds where they fail. And then the next thing is the Sermon on the Mount where he goes up to a mountain and gives his new sort of what a Torah written on the heart would look like, right? So it's the story of Israel, of exile and return. And then Matthew's gospel ends with Jesus celebrating a Passover feast, right? Um, because what he's doing is he's speaking of the death he's about to die in terms of 
um, exile and exodus. So he's mm. he's situating his death in light of the new exodus because Passover is embedded in the new in the in the exodus. And then he dies. He dies really as uh, as Hebrews will say outside the camp, bearing our sins. He dies as somebody who's cursed with mm. the curses of the covenant outside of the city, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the death of a, a cursed person, basically taking the scapegoat imagery of the Old Testament, um, cutting off from the people, exile, right? Away from God, banished from the people, banished from God's presence, banished from God's land. And, and the New Testament set, sees in that Jesus taking the exile of his people so that his people can take his, um, his blessings and, and life. Mm. That is something. Yeah. And you're using this all, this is just an example. Yeah, this is one, this is one example. We could do this all day with all sorts of others. All kinds yeah. of story themes. Well, and this whole, yeah, wow, the concept of the of the storyline in 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 scripture. Like, yeah, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to think about that because I can, I can, I'm very much seeing how this could be very applicable yeah. in a lot of different ways, you know, just in, in general, like how we read, yeah. oh, uh, how time. we read stuff, oh, yeah. you know, it's oh, not, yeah. I'm not, you're not reading a chapter in isolation, you know, you're no. not, not reading a book even in no. isolation because these things connect all across. And the, I think that's the, thread, the key. You know? That's one of the key things is when you start realizing there's connections everywhere, mm. you start looking for them mm. and then you see them. That's kind of the one big thing that, that we, that people just, yeah, it's not a quick, you can't just be like, how do I know everything I need to know about this? It's more like you need yeah, to just yeah. change your perspective mm. on what you expect from the text. Hmm. And once you see, once you realize, oh, this is how this, the Bible works, mm -hmm. then you see it everywhere and you can't unsee it. But it would also, it feels like this this methodology, again, biblical theology or whatever, you know, this framework you're presenting um, would by its very nature mean you're reading a much more across the whole sweep of scripture. Oh, yeah. You know, you're, you, there's, mm -hmm. which gets me excited because right. like the whole of scripture is being involved. Because honestly, mm. like so many people, myself included, only read in certain parts of the Bible. Right. And it's like the Torah, you know, eh, which just, don't really read. I mean, right. well, maybe a little bit in Genesis, but right. most of that is just, just like, kind of, you know, but then you look at all oh, like, I don't know, Jesus, you know, quoting Deuteronomy a bunch. And then you're like, wait a mm -hmm. second, there's probably stuff back there I should know, but mm -hmm. it's kind of hard to know what mm -hmm. do I read and stuff. But what you're describing is, is bringing that into as part of the essential process oh, yeah. of reading and understanding mm -hmm. scripture. And I think that's fantastic. Yeah. But, yeah. Wow. Yeah. This, this, this is interesting. So let me just go to first Peter, mm -hmm. um, because what's, what Peter is doing is Peter see, and, and the rest of the New Testament authors are seeing that, yes, this new Exodus has kicked off in Jesus. And yet it hasn't done, it's not done yet because we're not at, back at the blessed land, which is for them, new creation, the new heavens and new earth. Um, and so that means that what it means to be a Christian right now at this time, from the whole span of between Jesus' first and second coming, is that we're, Christ, we're people who, yes, have been Passovered, right? <laughs> we've, we've, we've experienced the beginnings of Exodus, and yet we're exiles. Mm. And so the whole story, all the stories of Israel's exile, the story of Daniel, the story of Jeremiah and his letters to the ex, all that stuff speaks to the, the moment that we're living in as Christians. We're exiles. And Peter, mm. Peter's letter is framed around that. So what's fascinating is that First Peter, most scholars agree that First Peter is written primarily to a Gentile, audi Gentile Christian audience. Okay? okay? But he kicks off the letter by saying, Peter, an apostle of Messiah Jesus, to those who are the chosen exiles of the dispersion. So, and, and this is not a throwaway phrase. Oh, that's yeah, if, yeah, yeah. It's so frames, funny how I've I've read that yeah. and just not just you, it's so oh, it's just part of the greetings in the letter. You just it, kind of read so right not. through it. He's know? meaning to tell his people because Peter is oh, all wow. about suffering that will be followed by glory, mm. and it's all about framing this is what it means to live and suffer as a Christian, um, in light of you're in exile waiting for the final redemption. So then he'll say, um, according to God's mercy, he has caused us to be born again through. Uh, the resurrection of Jesus to an inheritance that is kept in heaven waiting for us to be revealed at the last time, that final salvation, speaking of the, of the inheritance, the inheritance mm -hmm. of what? The promised land, right? The new heavens yeah. and new earth. And then he says, so um, how, are you supposed to, how are you supposed to act? Do not, as obedient children, don't be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, your former gentile, you know, sinful way of life. But as the one who called you is holy, 
you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. And this is taking Exodus mm. language, the language of God's relationship to his people and saying, you're God's holy people. Mm -hmm. And so if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. Because you know that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as gold and silver, but with the, the blood, the precious blood of Christ. So know, remember that God has exodused you from mm. sin. And in light of that, live the rest of your life as exiles. So as people who, yes, are here in the world, but who don't belong here and are waiting for, um, for your, true, your true home. Mm. And so put away all malice and deceit and hypocrisy as sojourners and exiles in chapter two, ex abstain from the passions of your flesh, which wage war against your soul. Why? Because that's, you're, in, you're exiles, right? Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak evil against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Whoa. So, so live as people who are exiles in the surrounding world, not letting the world make you think that you're home and just sort of succumbing mm. to it, but also caring about what everyone else, how, how you witness to who you really are. Caring about that the Gentiles, which is really interesting, he's calling the non-Christians Gentiles, even though he's writing to ethnic Gentiles, right? <laughs> Why? Oh. Why? Because in the previous verse, he says, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people oh. for his own possession, which is straight up Exodus 19. Oh, yeah, okay. That starts making sense. Yeah. That's but a very, what he's doing very is, good point. He's taking Exodus language and, and language of God's relationship to Israel, and he's uh -huh. saying, this is your story now, right? That hmm. whole story, yeah, yeah, sure, you're, you're, you're ethnic Gentiles, whatever, but no, you are that. That story is yours. And, hmm. and so you live... Um, he says, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Look, you're God's people now. The Exodus story is yours. And so the exile story is yours too. So walk around as God's kingdom of priests, as Israel was supposed to do, um, and wait your time in exile, not caving to the pressures of sin, but waiting for the Gentiles to eventually glorify God on the day of visitation. What's fascinating about that word visitation is it's basically the same words, the form of the roughly the same word, um, that is used in Exodus for when, um, when, uh, Moses goes to the people and, and delivers to them, Hey, God is, God is here to, to redeem you. And they recognize mm -hmm. they, they rejoice because God has visited them. Hmm. Um, or at, in Exodus also when Moses takes, um, takes the bones of Joseph in the, exo in the uh, Exodus, he, he carts Joseph's bones. Mm. He, the, the text says, Joseph made them swear. It, he, Joseph said, God will visit you. And when he does, take my bones. So that language of, in, in First Peter, of wait for the day of visitation is saying, oh. live in exile as people who suffer, mm. people who are a good, bear God's name well to the Gentiles, mm. who don't make Egypt your home, Right and wait for God's visitation, double click, the new Exodus that you're, that you're you know, waiting for. And then this, this is why he speaks so much about slaves, be subject to your masters, wives be, be submissive to your husbands, particularly I think um, somewhat, he's, not, not entirely, but somewhat he's talking uh, about non-Christian husbands in, in this case. Hmm. Um, mm -hmm. He talks about, um, he talks about suffering, since the Messiah suffered in the flesh, arm yourself with the same way of thinking. Um, he says, don't be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you, but rejoice in that you were sharing in, in the Messiah's suffering. Um, and then he says that uh, he and all of us, by implication, are sharers in the sufferings of the Messiah, as well as a partaker of, in the glory that is to be, to be revealed in the future. So it's all framed around the idea that this motif of exile and then the expectation of full, full, the full realization of Exodus that has started drives what it means to live as a Christian in our world, in our society, hmm. right? As we wait for the conclusion of the exile theme is Genesis, is Revelation 21 and 22, when God's people hmm. are all brought to the new heavens and new earth and there's rest and peace and it's a restoration of Eden. God's presence is fully there, right? It's the ultimate 
you know, undoing of exile. Wow. So, I mean, that's... That's fascinating. Yeah, that's fascinating. too much, but... <laughs> <laughs> that's so that's I, I keep going when I, when I get started. Wow. On <laughs> okay, so you just outlined some very fascinating things. That, that was great. Uh, that, that thread, the storyline through scripture... However, at least in my own personal experience, and so I don't know how much the, the data is on this, but it seems like our, our Anabaptist people and mm. just in general, maybe uh, the American church, however you want to say it, um, tends to do the systematic theology thing more. Like what you just outlined uh, is not something I've heard people use that approach right. very it's often. Not, I mean, you yeah. know, even in, even in like Bible college and, you know, Bible schools and yeah. I don't know, wherever, sermons. Uh, why is that? That's a good question. I'm not totally sure. Um, it's, I think it's sort of an, in some ways, an accident of history in our culture that for various reasons over the last couple hundred years, maybe a few hundred years, um, especially maybe post, maybe post enlightenment, especially, I'm not sure, Hmm. um, that we like abstracted, um, we're, yeah, I, I think some of it really is, is, is the, the way that back in the 1700s kind of eventually theology and biblical theology got kind of separated mm. and um and for some reason we tend to like and think is more applicable and relevant um tangible just abstract sentences that i know what to do with or something uh yeah um and we tend to think of the story as being some kind of kind of unnecessary conveyor or like carrier of the meaning, which is the meaning is what I ab- abstract out of it mm. rather than no, the meaning is the story itself and you can't abstract the meaning. Mm. Uh, I, I, so I don't know. I, I'm, it's, it's, it's changing uh, now. There's certainly the rise of, you know, of the incre- increase in popularity of biblical theology um, is definitely in- really encouraging, but mm. it hasn't taken root everywhere yet. Mm-hmm. It's kind of, um, maybe it's a bit of a fascination with trying to nail down definitions and like that kind of thing. Is is that have anything to do with it? Yeah. I, yeah. And I think it's just become so, it's just become part of our own expectations now for generations that when I, yeah. when I look at the Bible, when I do theology, I kind of expect to see, I'm looking for a list of, of definitions to abstract nouns, <laughs> you know, which I'm all for. But, um, but that, I don't know, I'm not really sure. I would say it's because we tend to root ourselves in the epistles, but even that, I don't think that's the right answer, honestly, because I think the, Mm -hmm. I mean, I talk Galatians, I've talked Galatians, you know, a number of times. And one of the things this past time that I think was surprising to, to the students was the way that Paul himself is such a story based, he's a biblical theologian. Right. We tend to think mm-hmm. of him as the guy with all the abstract nouns, but no, he's, he's just doing, he's just doing biblical theology. Oh, interesting. Oh man. That feels like that could be a whole nother episode right there. Cause I would, I would love to see how that works. Yeah. Cause, when, cause yeah. He, he's like lifted up almost as, as that. Yeah. The, the, the definitions and the, you know, all these convoluted words and abstractions and, and mm-hmm. so forth. But that's interesting. I feel like yeah. you're hinting at something there that'd be worth. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and again, into, I'm, you know? I'm like a huge fan of Paul and I am a huge fan of, some of those big words. I think that sure. like defining justification is important and things like that. But most of what Paul's doing is is looking at the story of the Old Testament hmm. in light of Jesus and the outpouring of the Spirit. And that's the that's his theology, is the intersection of those things. Wow. Yeah. That's that's fascinating. Yeah. That's important. So with that being being the case, so if somebody's listening or watching this and they're saying, Wow, this is fascinating. Um how can they apply this in their own lives, whether it's just personal Bible study or maybe they're preparing a devotional to share at church or, or prepping a Sunday school lesson? Um, what are some really simple, practical tips? Because even as you're sharing this, I'm like, this is amazing, but how do I do this myself? Mm. You know, what, what are some simple tools and things we can use? Well, honestly, um, the solutions are not microwave ready, right? <laughs> so <Okay. laughs> part of... Uh, Okay, so one, I mean, probably the biggest thing that I, that I mentioned before was just by by exposure, one comes to ex, to change one's expectations. One tends to come to the text expecting a whole ton of connections everywhere else in the Bible. 
um, and one starts reading the Bible, expecting any passage to say to first of all reading it in in its sort of immediate context, but then reading it in light of everything that's come before it in redemptive history and everything that comes after it in redemptive history. But um, honestly, one of the biggest one of the biggest things then is you just you you have to become like as familiar as you can with the Bible. Mm -hmm. So with that expectation, I think it's both, right? You have to have that expectation um, that these this is all interconnected, but then you just got to read, right? Mm -hmm. A lot um, over, and it just takes years, right? I'm, all of us are still mm -hmm. are still learning and seeing because that's what that's what the prophets mm -hmm. did. Right. That's why they're that's why their literature is so steeped in earlier scriptures that that's what they're saturated in. That's what Paul, that's the reason Paul is and 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 Matthew and Luke and John, it's because they were so steeped in the Old Testament. Right. And there's really not much of a shortcut. There are good resources you can use that can help you get started. Um, there's lots of great stuff out there now, uh, especially in the last 10 years or 15 years. But at the end of the day, it's a lot of it's, you know, keep reading, keep reading mm -hmm. and expect that some of the places in the Bible where that you thought were less relevant are actually kind of relevant because they're going to provide um, pieces of the story and pieces of the symbolism that that later scripture is going to pick up. Mm -hmm. So it's it's this um, this idea of, of just reading the whole scope of scripture would be a, a decent place to start. Then, yeah. For like, yeah. just like immerse yourself in this. Like you were saying, they were saturated with it. Yeah. And so, well, remember, I mean, they didn't have like Bible Gateway or Logos or whatever. <laughs> and so when Paul's reading the Bible, it's he's it's it's whatever he has in his mind of the rest of the Bible. That's how he recalls connections, right? He's reading Isaiah and he's like, wait, 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 wait. Ah, yeah, this passage, right? And That's so a the, good point. The more passages you have in your head, the more stuff is going to like kind of the connection you're going to make in your head when you're yeah. reading any one passage is like, wait, that reminds me of this, this, and this, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I mean, there's, so, yeah, there's so many, like, there's so many examples. I mean, I teach, I teach like extensively on this kind of thing. So you yeah. can't, can't yeah. boil it all down. But yeah, so the three things I would say is um, one, just expect that the Bible is a unified story that, that, um, that is all interconnected. Second, be as familiar with as many parts of the, of the text as you can. And then third, there are great resources out there um, that can help you get started. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then biblical theology is not is also meant to inform systematics. So what at the very beginning of this episode, we, we said how systematics emphasizes conclusions, but still, how do you get there? Bad systematics is basically cherry picking a bunch of like proof texts. Yeah. Good, systema yeah. good systematic theology takes biblical theology, starts with biblical theology and understands it pretty deeply and then says, okay, based on the way this theme kind of works out, mm -hmm. these interconnected themes, now what synthesis and conclusions can we draw and how can we maybe use different language, language that maybe connects with our culture more, philosophical language, whatever, mm -hmm. to, kind of, to kind of convey those conclusions. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the difference between good and bad systematic. So it's still either, you know, either way, yeah, you, yeah. you kind of rely on biblical theology. Yeah. And maybe some of your listeners will say, "Well, this seems kind of impractical and and uh, and whatever." But I I would beg to differ. I think that um, I think the New Testament uh, is so steeped in this stuff. And like I showed in in First Peter, the story is it is meant to change the way we live. And so I think the one last thing I'll say is with biblical theology, when we think about application, we need to just expand what we mean by application. Hmm. Like I think with the story based nature of the Bible. Um, application is not just, here's a very specific thing I can do next Tuesday, but it is how do I reshape, how does the stories and how does the, the, the big story of the Bible reshape the way I, I view my life, right? Yeah. So yes, it's, I need to suffer well, suffer injustice well, love my enemies, whatever. But it's also, I need, as First Peter would say, you need to think of yourself through the lens of the story of exile, right? Um, that seems like nebulous, but... Mm -hmm. That's what that's what the text calls us to do is to change the way we see ourselves and the world through these stories. And that process takes a long time, but that's application. Wow. That seems like a process worth doing. Yeah. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank I appreciate you. you coming on, Paul. Thank you. <laughs>
Thanks for listening to this episode with Paul Lamachella. If you found this interesting, one of the topics he mentioned was his teaching on the book of Galatians. And we'd actually interviewed him about that topic. And you can find that episode linked in the description down below. Thanks again for watching and for your support of this podcast. You can find all our content over on our website at anabaptistperspectives.org. Thank you.